Hello, and welcome to the East Africa Business Podcast. I'm Sam Floyd, and I'm now based from Kenya, having explored the business environment across the region at the end of 2016, primarily through the use of this podcast, and deciding, for me at least, that it was the best one to live and work from. This episode, and the others in the archive, are all about showcasing startups and organisations who are playing their part in helping East Africa develop and grow. And by following along, you too can hear their stories. For now though, let's enjoy the rest of this funky intro music, and then get started with the episode. The main way that students learn how to pass an exam is by reading from a textbook. Traditionally, this has been built on the premise of publishers printing physical copies, distributing to schools and taking cash payments. This all comes at a cost which is prohibitively high for a lot of school children in East Africa. Tony and I spend this episode discussing Kitabu. They've turned the model on its head by digitising the content of these publishers and allowing students and teachers to access what they want when they want it, renting chapters from a book for a few US cents per day, paid for with mobile money. We also discuss how a lot of Kitabu's employees are still at university, other trends that Tony sees in the East African edtech space, and how a different interpretation of a donut can completely undermine attempts from abroad to distribute educational content. It's a great example of using a scalable technology to disrupt an industry, and so I hope you enjoy. Cool, so I'm here today with Tony from Kitabu. Uh, Tony, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cool, so we're actually here in this like, recording studio, which is next to your office. Mm. Um, can you tell us a bit about Kitabu and sort of a bit about you? Yeah, uh, so Kitabu is an edtech application. Uh, essentially what we've done is we've taken the entire curriculum that is required for students to learn and pass the Kenya certificate of you know, primary and secondary examinations. We've taken all these books from publishers who are in Kenya, put them on a mobile phone application, and now we're allowing students to rent it for a day, a week, a month, or a school term uh, using mobile money. It's a very simple application. It's not complicated. Very simple. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So we're, so we're, we're in Nairobi. And are the people using it also in Nairobi, or are they sort of everywhere? We we've we've never really. What we when we started, our goal was let's build something and then test it everywhere and then see how to get to market because we never really had a go to market strategy when we started. Um, now it's being used everywhere because wherever we go, we leave a footprint and people want to test it and they tell their friends, they tell their friends' it's friends, and they get their kids on. So it's kind of like a sporadic communal kind of word of mouth growth. We haven't done a national launch of any sort, but we have had some traction success. Um, so we are working on seeing how we can get it to everyone um, in a very loud manner towards the end of 2017. Like it. And, and just so I can get an idea, so rough scale, what sort of numbers are we talking? People so using we've reached the 15,000 users level, which is nice. But um, I think what, what we are lacking uh, is that use in schools. It is curriculum required in schools, but everybody's using it as quote unquote supplementary content because you're not allowed to use mobile devices in schools just yet, despite the fact that the Kenyan government has put quite a few devices in schools. So we're trying to figure out how to how to bridge that gap, how to jump that hoop, um, what to do. 15,000 students or users or teachers, we don't know who's what, is, is not a bad number to start with. It's a place to springboard from. But we know that the number of students we have in Kenya is roughly 8 million. So it's quite, I mean, it's, it's negligible. It's good, yeah, somewhere to go. Mm. Okay, so, so just so I've got it right. So it's, <clears throat> you've got this digital content mm-hmm. and you're essentially renting it out to people? Mm-hmm. Is that, yeah? Yeah, that's it. And so they're, how are they accessing it? So it's a mobile phone app for smartphones, right? So first of all, you have to have a smartphone, which is a bit of a challenge as it is, but there's still quite a few million with smartphones in the country. First, second, uh, it's the same textbooks that you have in classrooms, same publishers giving you the same book, uh, just EPUB format. So instead of having to buy the book up front because you've got the application and the book is in the application, very much like a digital library, you can rent it because the book doesn't get lost. It always stays in your device. Um, so if I don't need to read the book today, I will not rent it for today. If I need it for a term, I can rent it for a term, depending on what kind of money I have in my pocket. And mobile money is so huge in this country now, it's like a, it's, it's part of the economy very much. And so it's, it's something that anyone can be able to access if you have a mobile phone and you use mobile money. Right. And um, so how much does it cost? No, that's, that's the fun part. Right? So <laughs> so let's let me give you very, very basic mathematics. Right? So if a, if a book costs 300 shillings on the shelf or $3 on the shelf, um, if you're going to rent that book for a day and we're just to do random math and divide that by you know, 365 days, but a student is in school for about 270 of those. Um, so you're saying you divided a 300 shilling book by 270 days. So essentially the book's going to cost you around a shilling a day. right? And that's not counting Saturdays. I mean, that's counting Saturdays and Sundays. So remove those. The book can go as low as 50 cents, 50 Kenyan shilling cents, mm-hmm. which is a 25th of a dollar mm. a day. It is so affordable, you, you find children spending an average of, say, uh, two US cents a week for every book they would need for that week. 
for the courses they've got in class. So it's really affordable. But you see, the, for the publisher, it makes a lot of sense because, yes, it sounds like a little money per user, but when you've got scalability, you don't have issues of print, piracy, insecurity, transportation, uh, insurance, and all the things that come with printing a textbook. For them, it just, you know, I give you a digital copy. If you have a million users, I make a million shillings a day. That works. So the, the numbers and the scale are so obvious. The only thing that we haven't really done successfully is scale it. So, okay. And just so, so you're saying the users are these, they're like the students mm -hmm. and teachers. And the teachers. Yeah. So, what's the use case for the student and what's the use case for the teacher? The use case for the student is, is, is pretty straight shot. Um, I am required to study this content to be able to pass this examination, right? Um, the examination is based off this content. So, I need to have this content to be able to study it. So we end up having students coming to Kitabu to download the application when they're at home. And when they have assignments, when they need to read chapters, because the curriculum is preset by the national government, what you do is you know these are the books that you're required to have, but you have no access to them. So Kitabu allows you to get that access. And what we end up having is the students spending roughly, the students we know are students on Kitabu. We find them spending roughly seven to 10 shillings a week on the content that they need. And we've seen that consistency grow over time to the point where you find a student has downloaded 65 to 75% of the books they would need in class. And we make the assumption that they've got the other 15% hard copy. Uh, and these are not these are students who have access to a smartphone. So you're probably in the middle or upper middle class. And that's pretty awesome. Teachers, on the other hand, have a different use case because for them, you find a science teacher teaching six or seven classes. So they would need six or seven different textbooks that they would go through to teach the subject. So you find teachers, and this is how we differentiate. Down, the teachers usually download one select subject of content. They download everything. And we have them, uh, instead of doing what students do and paying PC, they pay for a larger chunk of time. And you find teachers paying for content in terms or in months, and they buy content in bulk. And you can always be able to see the, do, the times of the day when they are using what content. It's always consistent. Every week you can be able to see teacher Tom, for example, has used these ones uh, in the morning hours, he's used these ones in the mid-morning hours, he's used these ones in the early afternoon, and these ones in the evening. You can tell this is his subject, this is how he teaches. And we find them spending somewhere in the middle, in, in the range of maybe 250 to 400 shillings a month, which is about $2.50 or $4 a month, to get the books that they wouldn't need. And again, making the assumption that they have some of the books, we find them downloading about 65, again, 15 65% of the books, so we assume that they've got 15% of the books uh, physically with them in class. Got it. And in that case, is it that... Is the teacher themselves paying, or have they got like budget from the school to do that? It depends now. It really, really depends. Um, I would say upmarket teachers have the textbooks, so they would not necessarily use Kitab as much. Um, mid market teachers do not have a lot of the books and find themselves in a situation where the school necessarily doesn't have them, so they end up buying the books themselves. Um, low market or bottom of the pyramid teachers, the school doesn't have the money for the books, the teachers don't have money for the books, so they end up having to find a way to either raise money or get money themselves or do a side job and get teachers to, or friends to, and pass them money for them to be able to buy books from Kitabu. So it depends. There's, even in the middle class, there's four different ranges. So you can't say I'm from the middle class in Kenya. There's upper middle class, there's uh, middle middle class, there's lower middle class, and then there's at the base of the middle class. So I mean, the fact that your kids are in school is amazing. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on in there. So there's, it's difficult to come up with a very clean, clear-cut user case for teachers. Mm -hmm. But I know they do get the content from Kitabu because a lot of the people who use Kitabu, from the way their financial practice on the application is, these are older people. A lot of stuff is paid for at the end of the month by teachers, whereas students, it's more weekly or daily. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what... Okay. When you sort of have the, the content which, which you have, is it that you sort of, did you sort of first of all start and saying, right, we're going to get all of the science stuff on there and then we're going to make sure we've nailed science and then we're going to start adding subjects? Mm. Or does it only really make sense if you have all of the available content? If the latter, the latter. Okay. Because, because what we did was we went to a publisher and said, hey, you know, what do you have? And they're like, oh, we've got these four subjects. We're like, okay, we need all of them. Well, they happen to be for early childhood development doesn't matter give them to us anyway and then we go to another publisher what do you have i've got two subjects but they're all secondary school so i'll give us those so it is really dependent on who's giving us the content over who are we trying to target the value of having everything at once is you can be able to because as i said you never really created a go-to-market strategy you can be able to appeal to many people at once um the failure of doing math or english or sciences or whatever it's that niche market is even harder to find because i have to find you uh, eventually, we decided let the best way to go is let's go to schools and teachers and find out if they're interested in the content. And the first thing they ask us is, do you have these books or do you have this publisher? 
and that became the decision for us. We are not going to look for subjects. We're going to look for books and publishers, mm. and and that's that's always driven our our acquisition of content. Publishers, which books do you have? I see. So so the t- the science teacher is not looking for a generic. No, oh, they're looking for like a specific. Yes, very specific. Very, because the books, the way the Kenyan government works, they've got the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development, which is the gatekeeper of content that goes into learning in classrooms. They are the ones who decide what books make it into the classrooms. And the exams for those classrooms come from the books that they have acknowledged should be used in classrooms. So if we have a very studying for the exam mindset. So if it, if the content is not guaranteed or at least partially guaranteed to be in in the exam, I'm not going to be interested in it. So that's kind of how we've got, that's how, that's how it's working now. Nice. Yeah. And um, so is, is there like one particular chapter or one particular bit of content which is you can see is like this is the most popular? No, or, or no. is it? Yeah. I've had that question a lot of yeah. times. What is the most popular? There, is, there, isn't, there isn't one. There, isn't, yeah. there really isn't. There isn't one that kind of stands up. Ah, no. It just depends on what. And this is how we know that people are reading for examinations because there was, if there was an interest, if there was something that was of interest to people greatly across the board, it would stand out. Nothing stands out. Mm. Nothing stands out. Not STEM, uh, not languages, not humanities. Nothing stands out. It's just what what is in the curriculum now. That's what people are reading. Got it. Yeah, that's it. And um, so you say is it smartphones that mm-hmm. people are doing. Mm-hmm. So just so I've got this right, let's say I'm a student. Mm-hmm. I've got some. I'm doing some revision. Mm-hmm. I've I'm doing some. I'm making making notes. And next to me, I've got my smartphone. And I'm scrolling through. Yeah, just oh, it's just it's it's an e it's quite literally it's an e reader. It's yeah. just an e reading file. The only difference is now we've added a couple of new tweaks and twerks to it. Uh, all the Kenyan national examinations that have ever been since two thousand and nine now in Kitabu. So if you're reading to do a physics exam and you're in the fourth year of your secondary school and the exam is, is at the end of the year, you can be able to go back seven years and see what are the exams these guys did. Oh, that's all that's all in Kitabu. Mm-hmm. And then if you look at a topic that you don't understand. You can go and look at the textbooks in Kitabu and you know search for physics books, and all the physics books will show. I mean, you pick the one you want, you rent it for that day, uh, you'll open it up, turn the page just like you would on a normal device, or you know just yeah, like a normal book. Yeah. Get to the page that you're looking for and read the content that it is. It's not fancy. We haven't like added video and audio and VR, and we haven't done any of that because at this point we're just trying to get you content. Mm. Understand? Only 16% of the Kenyan students in this country have access to a book, not all the books, just a book. When you start saying how many have access to even just half the books, it, it can even go down to 1.2%. Or 2%. Mm. Because these books, are, even for us, when I was younger, when I was a mid-class student, they were too expensive for my parents, who are both professionals. Mm. And so I'm trying to imagine knowing that a very small percentage of Kenya can, can get to that level. Nine million of us are below the poverty line. How many of those, knowing that 10 million people in this country of 44 million are in school, can afford those textbooks mm. so, so it's just about getting the basics ac- access done and then once we do that we can start growing different forms of learning and different forms of learning experiences i see mm. okay um <clears throat> and so with the just so on, on the screen it, when you get to things like i don't know a big graph mm-hmm. or like a big table mm-hmm. it, is again does so, so that sort of render okay i mean it renders really well so what yeah. we did was um we put more emphasis this is something this is a very cold conversation we put more emphasis in design of I mean, in scalability of, of the images than rendering of the text. And we did that on purpose because we're saying, look, there's very, I mean, text, whether you have a big tablet or you have a small phone, text can always hit you up at the same font. You know, you can always zoom in, zoom out, the page can be longer. Whatever. But the image is really tricky. So Kitabu has been built to be a profile, not a landscape. Um, is it profile? Yes, it's profile. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's like long, 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 it's long longer. Thing. It's long longer. Thing. Yeah, it's yeah. a long thing, not yeah. a wide thing. Yeah. Uh, so it's not landscape in the way it's been designed because we wanted to stand like a book does, and the book is always longer, uh, longer up and thinner wide, and so that's kind of how we built it. And but you know when images come to play, you want to see them really, you know, really well. So if you double tap on the image and twist the phone, the image can turn into a landscape image and you can see it and it renders really well. Yes, the books are a little heavier because of the images, so that's a data cost on students that they don't like. Um, but it's an image or it's a book that otherwise you don't, you, you're probably not going to find it anywhere. I see. Uh, and we've been doing this five years, we know that th- there's, a, there's an inconvenience of poverty that a lot of people just, an inconvenience of access that a lot of people are willing to, to bear when you know that, you know, it's either I download this and spend some money on data or I have to go looking for a couple of bookshops to find this book. Mm-hmm. Maybe they don't mind it too much anymore. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I was about to, to ask, I mean, what, what is the, the main competition that you see? Textbooks. Okay. 
So yeah, textbooks. They're definitely textbooks. Um, the the ed tech space is really green. Um, it's not really big yet. Publishers are really good though. Yeah, they're very kind and willing to you know, test new test new waters because they're like, look, we've been doing this business. Let me get an example. The largest publisher we have in Kenya, Longhorn Publishers, said that last year they lost four point eight million dollars in piracy last year. Now, four point eight million dollars for a company that's public and is making roughly ten to fifteen million dollars a year profit. That's uh, that's that's back breaking. Mm. You know, because it doesn't take much. People don't buy books for the quality of the book, they buy books for the content. So what you end up seeing is before the book has been printed out, there are copies on the street. Mm. You know, someone inside the publishing house uh, has been, you know, called out on or bribed or you know, there's a lot of challenges that they're having. But if you have a digital footprint, that that has an impact because digital is difficult. Digital, you can be able to do so much more with it. You can't just take screenshots of Kitab and run away. There's a lot of barriers and things we've put. And also with those things, there's a convenience of digital that that is very different. I mean, it's so much cheaper. So there's a lot of stuff that um, publishers have come to terms with and they think a digital solution would work better. Mm. Let's try it. And that, that goodwill is what's keeping us going. Nice. <clears throat> I mean, is there a chance that they might look to develop their own sort of it's, software? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. People have said that to me. But I always say it's kind of like sugar companies starting a supermarket and selling their own sugar. I mean, if I'm going to walk into a supermarket for one product, I'm not going to go there many times. And it's difficult to see one publisher building an app for themselves and then all 19 of them do the same. Uh, is that going to work? You, wanna, you want to get somebody neutral who's transparent, who can secure my content, but who can be able to do all the work of development, adding value. To the, let me just publish. That's my key role. Remember, these are companies from the 60s that, are, that we're talk, talking about. So if they were to build their own, it would be skewed to their own product. Mm-hmm. So it would probably be this publisher goes with their product, that publisher their own product. But the reality of it is if I'm trying to learn something, I don't need your book only. I need everybody's. Mm-hmm. And that's that's kind of how the system has been built. So it doesn't make any financial sense for anyone to do that. They know that. That's why there aren't many apps by publishers in the space. Because it makes no sense to tell me that your books are the best ones. No, they're not. Uh, no, they're not. <laughs> Everyone has a right to be able to say something and I should be able to access all of them. Yeah. And is there a, I mean, do you find, is there a difficulty in trying to take these diff, 19 or so different publishers and then essentially trying to get them all into one single format, i.e. the Kitabo format? Yeah, there is, there's is a lot of challenges in that, but we, you know, that's part of being a startup. You, you, you know, you sell yourself, you sell your vision, you sell your dream, you raise money for it. You take a lot of the heat of trying to make things work and fail, succeed, fail, succeed until eventually you get something that works for everyone. And then that's what you use. That's what we spend most of our time doing. The last three and a half years or so is what we've been trying to do. Get a format that works, EPUB. Get a security system that accounts for everyone. Have a backend that allows all the publishers to see their own content. You know, do all these things. Just create all these things piece by piece. And then once you've built that reputation, I mean, once you've built the product, you realize you've also built your reputation because you've been in the game for a while. They're like, yeah, we've always seen you. You know, you never came, touched the waters and left. And that goodwill kind of grows in time. You don't just make goodwill the first time you meet. On the 15th time we've met, and you, you shouted at me three times ago, you threw things at me. Now we're kind of, you know, kind of built a relationship, it's solid. You know I'm staying, I'm not taking advantage of you. Let's make business work. That's kind of where we reached. Okay. Mm. And uh, in, in, let's say there's a, a, a new publisher came, what's, yeah. what's your rough pitch to, to get them on board? Is, is it something which, are you finding it's a hard sell? Or? <laughs> we used to, we used to, nice. <laughs> if a new publisher comes on board, they look for us. Okay. They come and they're like, you know what? If the Kenyan government itself has gone digital on education, why as a publisher would we not do that? Why would we not at least prepare ourselves for it? So, so it's not a difficult thing to say. Uh, scalability, obviously, we do a better job of scalability than anyone else as a tech company. We haven't started doing it, but then as a tech company, tech companies grow faster than publishing houses or bookshops or brick and mortar. So, and the cost is nothing. And give us your content, whatever we sell, you keep 70% of it. We keep 30. That's an easy enough sell. Okay. So, and this is standard practice globally. There's no brilliance to it. And there's no secret to it. It's just, and anyone who comes into Africa and wants to do business in Africa, they need to understand the one thing that will not be bought by money is relationship. They will take your money, yes, but try to deal with them. Then you realize people want to deal with people they know. They don't want to deal with people they don't know or they don't understand or they don't appreciate their motivation. So so I've, I've been lucky to be first born in Kenya, raised here, educated in the Kenyan public system. Um, been around most of the popular schools here, seeing people, uh, given a story that they can relate to and built a business with them because we built a business in a, in a relationship kind of manner, not in a who's making the most money kind of way. Seems to be working so far. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, 
what, what are some of the trends you're seeing in, in sort of the tech space in general? Obviously, you also, you've got the the e content mm-hmm. bit corner. Are there any other sort of when you're in these schools? Is there anything else that you're sort of seeing? Yeah, there's a lot of interest in video. There's a lot of interest in teacher generated content, um, and there's a lot of interest in infrastructure. Schools being able to have their own instead of buying something that is already in the market. Can we build our own infrastructure? Can we get our own this? Can we get our own connectivity devices? Can we get our own get our own? And I was asking, well, why why would you just go and buy something that's in the market? And, and I realize people don't understand the space so well. And when you don't understand the space, you don't want to be told what to get. You want to get what you know what's for you. So in one school we're going to, um, we're putting some tablets in about 50. Uh, there's an interest in people being able to say, the parent buys the device. As long as it's Android, just you get what you're comfortable with because it's going to be your device. Yes, we put it in our suit, but then once you put it out, it's going to become your kid's thing, which is a very interesting model. And I'm like, yeah, parents are interested in buying these things. They're interested in learning as well. They're interested in being involved. Uh, and maybe one size fits all will not work, which is especially because GitHub is not a hardware company, which is something we're open to. We're like, okay, fine. We're going to get some hardware as well. We're going to have to learn how to do hardware um, because essentially people are going to tell us, this is what we have as tablets. Can you make your stuff work on this? And so we're finding ourselves kind of being drawn into the hardware space, at least for local storage and a couple of things. So we're trying to build relationships with people in hardware to be able to sort out those uh, those trip ups that we don't necessarily focus on too much. And in terms of the the team, is it is sort of all the development? What, where is that done? Here, yeah, everything is done here. Completely, uh, completely can. Yeah, everything is done here. Um, we have a, we do have a Danish CTO, uh, but he's. Kenyan for all I know because he's been here for the longest time. Uh, but the whole team is Kenyan. Um, our CEO, former mobile service provider, director of e-learning and, and digital content, uh, myself, staff team, developers, all of us are Kenyan. And, and very young folk as well, hmm? not, not, not too old. Without Paul, who's the CEO, and myself, the average office age is 22. 22. Mm-hmm. So are these, have they been to university? Yes, they are in university. Most of them are oh, still in oh, university. Still yeah, university. Yeah, yeah. Okay. and they're doing computer engineering, sales of courses, PR, marketing, that kind of thing. I think there's uh, there's something to be said about the millennials who don't have the typical millennial mindset of um, deserving everything, being entitled. If you get a good bunch of people, then you'd be very fortunate because they're very driven, very focused. If you don't, then you're screwed. Basically, yeah. okay. that's, that's another short answer. So, I mean, are these, so I'm a bit interested in this, so, so people that are currently at university, in their spare time, they come and work here? Because university is, um, so you see, university now is because you can, obviously, you're able to pick your own courses, plan yourself, it's easier to do, you know, Saturday classes, evening classes, and maybe one or two weekly classes. Uh, so they're able to create a timeline that allows them to come okay. to the office. For a typical nine to five, I mean, nine, yeah, nine to four day, um, which is pretty good, which is pretty fine. Yeah, to, we don't have a problem with it. Um, as we've progressed and grown, we've, we've realized that if you can build, and this is why it's important to have a good technology expert, if you can build something that doesn't fail as much, you don't need developers as consistently looking out for bugs as possible. So we've got a really professional CTO. He's he's a pro uh, and he's old school. So Paul, myself and him, you know, pretty up there in our ages. Uh, but we're able to run a, a team of agile, funky, happy developers, which is what we're trying to do. Thank okay. you. Very cool. Um, since you started, Kutabu, um, have there been any, well, like, what are the main surprises that have happened? Um, the main, main surprise is it's very slow. Education is a big thing. It's a billion dollar market, if not a trillion dollar market. It's huge. But it's very traditional. And it's not so much because the industry doesn't want to change. It's because people don't want to change. People are very are you sure my son is going to pass the exam? Everyone is very scared. And I can understand why in a country like Kenya, um, having two degrees doesn't guarantee you a job. So bringing a new spanner in that works and saying, hey, you know what, this app is going to help the kid live and succeed, succeed and become a bigger success is not something I can promise anyone. Um, so there's a lot of skepticism, which was a big surprise for me. That's the first thing. Big surprise, skepticism. The second thing is how much money is going towards education. I mean, the amount of money going towards education traditionally from the big donor types and all, is towards traditional brick and mortar type or very basic, very non-projected, very non-thoughtful programs. That surprised me. I was like, why would you, why would you invest in that? What do you, what do you mean by non-thoughtful programs? So let me give an example. Um, so there was one huge project for many, many millions of dollars to get textbooks out into, into rural communities. But then the thought has not gone into what rural communities look at textbooks and see. You know, when, when, what are they thinking when they get these textbooks? There, there's a very big gap. 
So in one case, we went to a place where they got a ton of textbooks and we realized that, yeah, that they stayed in the library. And I'm like, but why, why aren't you reading textbooks? Why, you know, why are you not reading this? This is a good math book. It can summarize a lot of issues. And somebody told us, yes, we went and we saw, now they're telling me in, in their native language, we went and we saw the books and, and they're translated and all of that. But my child came across this thing called radius and diameter, which you know everybody knows is in mathematics. But they used this thing called a donut to explain that. What is a donut? Small nuances like that. Mm. Small new. Oh my gosh, small. Because th we have donuts. We just don't call them donuts. We call them mandazis, mm. and they're triangular and they're puff. There's no middle. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. just, it's just cultural nuances. <laughs> so it's it's really it's more than just putting stuff out. It's knowing what kind of stuff to put out. You know, whose stories are you reading? Mm -hmm. If you're reading stories that have been done by Penguin Books and Pearson and McGraw Hill, you're probably reading about Cinderella and Snow White and something like that. Where are we relating to a ladybird that sings? What is that? You know what I mean? It doesn't make any sense. Get local content that un understand the context of the content. So you can't take a book from Eastern Kenya, take it to Western Kenya and say, hey, here's an African story. It doesn't work like that. It just doesn't forget taking books from West Africa and bring them to East Africa. It's just the cultural nuances are so different. So we have to, if you're going to try and do a project in those kind of things, there's such, you know, it's not just about pedagogy. That's just a big fancy word that professionals use. It's about context. It's about you understanding that me seeing a rabbit running is not the same as me seeing a bunny running. They sound the same, but they're not the same. <laughs> it's just, ah, it's just, oh my God. And they're such silly things, but they really do matter. So, okay. So, so it's been surprising at how much, how much, is, how much, like, we call it bad money. How much okay. bad money is thrown at education. Yeah. Uh, and, but the last thing also is, is um, how, how little of Africa and how little of Kenya has an influence on Kenyan content. Mm. Uh, that's, that was a big surprise. Uh, a lot of what's, a lot of what Kenyan publishers have put is in the textbook and education space. But that's not what's read the most. Um, what's read the most set pieces, storybooks like those, uh, Shakespeare and that kind of thing. There's a lot of that. And it makes it sound like we don't have our own, which is uh, disturbing to an mm. extent. Yeah. That's been a big surprise. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah so. And uh, we'll just do a few more questions. Yeah, that's go right. ahead. Um, so if we were to fast forward three years, five mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. what does Kitabu look like? <laughs> People ask me that, I'm like, I have no idea. I don't know. Um, if we get our if we get our marketing plan right, um, my my expectation, my hope is to have, um, a, obviously larger number of users, very very large number of users, um, but also to be able to have a more interactive learning experience where teachers and students can be able to meet on the platform, students and students can meet on the platform, and where video can do more than just be a source of entertainment. It can be a source of education and information, and we are working very hard to doing that, especially with uh, the Kenya National Museums. Uh, giving us access to a lot of their content and a lot of their spaces, and us feeling like there's a need for us to take this into classrooms because we can't take classrooms into all the museums in the country. So we're looking at um, as Kitabu being able to be not just a source of information and education, but being a source of personal identity. And we want to define, if, if not at all, if, if not support the definition of, we want to help define what African content, content can be, not just in Kenya, but in East Africa uh, as a start, Sub-Saharan Africa as, as a second growth region, and then all of Africa in the next couple of years, if not a decade or so. so. We're going to be here for a while, that's for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in short, what, what does Kitabu mean? Book. Book. In like 69 languages. So, and as six, 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 yeah. 69. 69. I'm like, what? It's like, it's Haitab, it's Hitab, it's Kitabu, it's even in native languages. Uh, some of them is like things like Ifuku, Ifuk. And uh, some of them, some very few have book or a hook as a as a as a language name for book. But from everything from Punjabi, um, most Arabic Arabic languages, uh, very quite a number of Bantu languages, even Eastern European languages. Um, Kitabu Haitab Kitu uh, always has something to do with, with the book, which is cool because you know hey, that's the kind of brand you want, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. awesome, cool. Well, Tony, thanks so much. Thank you, Sam. Cool, awesome. Before we head, just a quick moment to say thank you for listening. You can see the show notes of this episode by heading to samfloy.com forward slash podcast and then searching for the episode title. That's S-A-M-F-L-O-Y dot com forward slash podcast. Now, a few people have got in touch and have been asking about how this podcast came about. And well, it all started when I took a one-way flight to Rwanda to seek out business opportunities across the region. 
I'm now at the stage of formulating a bit of a plan of the business I want to go into based on all of these podcast interviews and will be keeping a record of what I get up to on my blog. And so if you're interested in being kept in the loop, you can sign up to the newsletter there. Again, it's samfloy.com. Also, if you have any questions, comments or feedback about the podcast or indeed anything, please feel free to email me podcast at samfloy.com and I'd be very happy to chat. In any case, have a great week and speak to you soon.